fluid mechanics. In fluid mechanics, let me start what does it mean by fluids and then I will go on explaining each and every um, each and everything in the fluid in this subject. Fluid mechanics is basically it is a, uh, it is the study of fluids and they are and the forces on them. It includes liquids, gases, plasmas. Fluid mechanics can be divided into fluid kinematics, which is the subject of fluid motion and the fluid dynamics, which is the study of the effect of forces on fluid motions. It can further be divided into fluid statics, means uh, this is the study of fluids at rest and fluid kinetics, which is the study of fluids in motion. So, in fact, uh, in fact, in terms of uh, mechanics uh, problem, it is in fact, it is the branch of continuum mechanics, which is a subject. It models matter without using the information that it is made up of atoms, rather it models macroscopic point of view rather than from the microscopic point of view. Fluid mechanics is an active field of research with many solved or unsolved problems. Sometimes it becomes mathematically complex. So, in those circumstances it can best be handled using some numerical methods typically using computers. Nowadays uh, a modern discipline in computer simulation studies become popular which is devoted to solve the fluid mechanics problem which is known as computational fluid dynamics CFD. There are some experimental methods also for visualizing and analyzing the fluid flow uh, uh, which is known as particle image velocimetry by taking advantage of highly visual nature of fluid flow. Historically, fluid mechanics has a long story. Uh, study of fluid mechanics goes back to the days of ancient Greece when Archimedes studies fluid statics and buoyancy and formulated uh, a theory which is known as Archimedes principle. Medieval Persian as well as Arab natural philosophers including Abu Rayani, Al Buruni and Alu Khazini combined that uh, earlier work with dynamics to foretell precise the later development of fluid dynamics. Rapid development in fluid mechanics began with Leonardo Vinci with the observation as well as he has performed many simple experiment to demonstrate different aspects of fluid mechanics. Uh, Torselli who is who invents the barometer, Isaac Newton which invented the viscosity concept and Pascal who is who deals the hydrostatics parts and was finally, continued to uh, by Bernoulli with the introduction of mathematical fluid dynamics in hydrodynamica in 1738. There are basically two kinds of uh, fluid flow, we, we can call one is viscous flow and another is non-viscous flow. Non-viscous flow is known as the ideal flow and viscous flow is known as non-ideal flow. So, non-viscous fluid flow was further analyzed by various mathematicians just Leonard, Euler, D'Alembert, Lagrange, Laplace, Poisson, etcetera and viscous flow was explored by multitude of engineers including Poiseli and Ludwig Hagen. Further mathematical justification was provided by Navier and Stokes which is known as famous Navier-Stokes equations and we will talk about on later. And boundary layers were investigated Ludwig Pentel while various scientists Reynolds, Kolmogorov, uh, Taylor, they advanced the understanding of fluid viscosity and turbulences. Fluid mechanics basically it is a sub-discipline of continuum mechanics as illustrated in the following table. Basically, it is the continuum mechanics which is the study of the physics of continuous materials. It can further divided into two things, 
one is known as mechanics of rigid body, which tells you the study of physics of continuous materials with a defined rest shape. Second one is the fluid mechanics. It is the study of physics of continuous materials which take the shape of the their container. So, again rigid body dynamics can be divided uh, can be thought of in two ways. One is elasticity which describes the material that return to their uh, rest shape after an applied stress. Second one is plasticity which describe materials and that permanently deform after a sufficient applied stress. Fluid dynamics again can be divided into two fluids. One is known as non-Newtonian fluids, another is known as Newtonian fluids. However, we will discuss these parts non-Newtonian fluids and Newtonian fluids in the latter part of my talks. As you know like any mathematical model of the real world, you need some assumptions on which the your model uh, uh, relies on. So, same way fluid mechanics make some basic assumptions about the materials being studied. These assumptions are turned to into equations that must be satisfied if the assumptions are to be held true. For example, consider an incompressible fluid in three dimension. Incompressible means where the density does not change, this is known as incompressible fluid. Though the assumptions that mass is conserved means that for any fixed closed surface such as a sphere, the rate of mass passing from outside to inside the surface must be the same as rate of mass passing the other way. That means, mass inside remains constant as does the mass outside which can be turned into an integral equation over the surface. In fact, if you will summarize the assumptions, fluid mechanics assumes that every fluid obeys the following rules, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum and the continuum hypothesis. Further, it is often useful at subsonic conditions to assume a fluid is incompressible, that means the density of the fluid does not change. Liquid can often be modeled as incompressible fluid, whereas gases cannot. Similarly, it can sometimes be assumed that the viscosity of the fluids is 0, that means fluid is known to be non-viscous. Some gases can often be assumed to be non-viscous. If the fluid is viscous and its flow content in some way example in a pipe, then the flow at the boundary must have zero velocity. For a viscous fluid, if the boundary is not porous, the shear forces between the fluid and the boundary results also in a zero velocity for the fluid at the boundary. This is called the no slip condition. For a porous media otherwise, in the frontier of the containing vessel, the slip condition is not zero velocity and the fluid has a discontinuous velocity field between the free fluid and the fluid in the porous media. Now, what does it mean by continuum hypothesis? We need to understand very well depending on that whether the fluid can be dealt in the conventional fluid mechanics or using the statistical mechanics. So, let me try to understand what does it mean by continuum hypothesis in the fluid mechanics. Fluids are composed of molecules that collide with one another and solid objects that means container of the fluid. The continuum assumptions however, considers fluid to be continuous that is properties such as density, pressure, temperature and velocity are taken to be well defined at infinitely small point known as the fluid element at the geometric order of the distance between two adjacent molecules of the fluid. Properties are assumed to vary continuously from one point to another and are averaged over in a fluid element that means averaged over in delta V. The fact that that fluid is made up of discrete molecule is ignored. 
the continuum hypothesis, it is basically an approximation. In the analogy, the, the planets are approximated by point masses, point center of a um, uh, point particle, where, who, when dealing with celestial mechanics and therefore, results in an approximate solution. Consequently, assumptions of the continuum hypothesis can lead to results which are of not desired accuracy. However, under this under the right circumstances, the continuum hypothesis produces extremely accurate result. Uh, now, uh, in a couple of minutes, we will try to understand at what circumstances continuum hypothesis hold good, at what circumstances it does not hold good the continuum hypothesis. In that case, we need to resort to the more fundamental theory, which is known as statistical mechanics. These problems for which the continuum hypothesis does not allow solution of desired accuracy are solved using statistical mechanics. To determine whether or not to use conventional fluid dynamics or statistical mechanics, we need to evaluate some number for the given problem. That number is known as Knudsen number. The Knudsen number, which is uh, denoted as k n is a dimensionless number defined as the ratio of the molecular mean free path to a representative physical length scale. For an example, this length scale could be the radius of a body in a fluid. This number is named after Danish physicist Martin Knudsen. Now, let us try to understand how to calculate the Knudsen number and from the Knudsen number how to understand that when I should allow, when I should apply the conventional fluid mechanics, when I should apply the statistical mechanics to understand the fluid dynamics. So, the Knudsen number is a dimensional number which is defined as k n equal to lambda upon L, where lambda is the molecular mean free path and L is the representative physical length scale. So, that justifies that it is a dimensionless number. For an ideal gas, the mean free path as you know uh, uh, can be calculated easily, uh, where k n equal to k b t by square root pi sigma square uh, uh, p l, where k b is the Boltzmann's constant, t is the uh, temperature of the system, sigma is the particle heart cell diameter and P is the total pressure. For, for an example, for particle dynamics in the atmosphere and assuming standard temperature and pressure that is 25 degree centigrade and one atmosphere pressure, we can calculate the value of the <coughs> mean free path which is of which comes about 8 into 10 to the power minus 8 meter or approximately 2.6 into 10 to the power minus 9 feet. Mean free path means this is the distance during which particle will not collide to each other. Okay. Now, let us calculate uh, the uh, let us uh, try to uh, get the relationship between Mach and Reynolds number in the gases in the fluids itself, because it is a very interesting relation which tells you under which circumstances uh, you have to deal the fluid dynamics using the conventional fluid mechanics and under what circumstances we have to deal with the statistical mechanics. Let me try to understand what is the relations between them. The Knudsen number can be related to the Mach number and the Reynolds number, which we are going to uh, uh, calculate now. Dynamic viscosity is defined as mu is half rho c bar lambda, where c bar is nothing but the average molecular speed, which can be obtained from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which I have already talked in my earlier talks, where c bar is defined as root over 8 k b t by pi m. Thus, the mean free path lambda is mu by rho, mu upon rho root over pi m by 2 k b t. So, that means, mean free path can be defined in terms of the dynamic viscosity, which is defined by the relations that mu upon rho root over pi m by 2 k b t. Dividing through L, uh, the Knudsen number is defined as 
lambda upon L, which is nothing but mu upon rho root over pi m by 2 k b t, where c bar is the average molecular speed, which I have already told it can be obtained from the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. T is the thermodynamic temperature, if the system is maintained at thermal equilibrium, then in that case T is known as the temperature. Mu is the dynamic viscosity, m is the molecular mass, k b is the Boltzmann's constant and rho is the density of the fluid. Before uh, going to the relations uh, uh, between the Knudsen strain number and Mach number etcetera, let us try to understand what does it mean by Mach number. Mach number is the speed of an object moving through air or any other fluid substance divided by the speed of sound as it is as it is in that substance for its particular physical conditions including those of temperature and pressure. It is commonly used to represent the speed of an object when it is travelling close to or above the speed of sound. So, Mach number is defined as the ratio u infinity upon C s, where C s is the speed of sound which is defined as root over gamma r t upon m or root of in terms of uh, Boltzmann's constant root over gamma k b upon t, where gamma is the ratio of specific heat C p upon C b. This relation we have already derived in my earlier lectures in the kinetic theory of gases and u infinity is the free stream uh, speed and r is the universal gas constant, m is the molar mass and as usually gamma is the theory ratio of specific heats C p upon C b. Second one which is more uh, uh, interesting in the fluid mechanics, uh, who, uh, many people have already heard this name which is known as the Reynolds number. The dimensionless Reynolds number is a dimensionless number that gives a measure of the ratio of the internal forces to the viscous forces and consequently quantifies the relative importance of the two type of forces for given flow condition. The concept was first introduced by Gabriel Stokes in 1851, but the Reynolds number is named after Reynolds uh, who popularized its use in 1883. It is defined as R e equal to rho into u infinity L upon mu. Dividing the Mach number uh, by the Reynolds number, you can get the ratio mu upon rho L root over m upon gamma k b t into uh, gamma pi upon 2, which is nothing but mu by rho L root over pi m by 2 k b t. And if you will multiply this equation by root over gamma pi by 2, you will get m a by r e equal to u infinity by C s and rho u infinity L upon mu, which is nothing but mu upon rho L C s. And if you will substitute the values of C s, you will get mu upon rho L into gamma k b t by m, which turns out to be mu by rho L into root over m gamma k b t and the Knudsen number is obtained. So, finally, you can get the relation of Mac, Reynolds and Knudsen number are related as k n equal to m a by r e into gamma pi by 2. The Knudsen number is useful for determining whether statistical mechanics or continuum mechanics formulation of fluid dynamics should be used. For an example, if the Knudsen number is near or greater than 1, the mean free path of a molecule is comparable to the length scale of the problem and the continuum assumption of fluid mechanics is no longer a good approximation. In that case, statistical mechanics must be used. Similarly, other way around, if it is less than 1, then continuum assumptions of fluid mechanics will be a valid approximation. In that case, the usual fluid mechanics formulation is good enough to calculate any quantities in the fluid dynamics. Problem for an example, problems with high node strain number include the calculation of motions of a dust particle through the lower atmosphere or the motion of a satellite through the exosphere 
one of the most widely used application of the node strain number is in microfluids and MEMS device design. The solution of the fluid around an aircraft has a low node strain number making it firmly in the realm of continuum mechanics. However, in that case uh, in an aircraft uh, it goes from no node strain number to high node strain number. So, that makes the complicated nature of the fluid flow across an aircraft. So, now let me uh, talk uh, in a small summary, what does it mean by Navier Stokes theorem, which is one of the most beautiful equation in fluid dynamics. The Navier Stokes equation named after Claudie Louis Navier and George Gabriel Stokes are the set of equations that describe the motion of fluid substances such as liquids and gases. However, this equation is in the non-relativistic uh, fluid equation. These equations state that change in momentum of fluid particles depend only on the external pressure and internal viscous forces similar to friction acting on the fluid. Thus, the Navier-Stokes equation describe the balance of forces acting any given region of the fluid. The Navier-Stokes theorem are differential equation which describe the motion of a fluid. Such equation establish relation among the rates of change of the variable of interest. For example, the Navier-Stokes equation for an ideal fluid with zero viscosity states that that acceleration is proportional to the derivative of the internal pressure. Okay. In case of ideal fluid that means there is no viscosity. Okay. This means that the solution of Navier-Stokes equation for a given physical problem must be sought with the help of calculus. In practical terms only, the simplest cases can be solved exactly in this way. These cases generally involve non-turbulent steady flow, flow does not change with time in which the Reynolds number is small. As we know that if the Reynolds number is very small, then uh, the flow is the laminar flow, non-turbulent flow. If the Reynolds numbers become large, if the velocity will become too large, in that case Reynolds numbers will be very large. In that case, uh, the flow will no more be the laminar flow, it will be the turbulent flow. For more complex situations such as global weather systems like El Nio problem or lift in a wing, Solution of the Navier-Stokes equation can currently only be found with the help of computers. This is the field of sciences by its own called computational fluid dynamics. General, uh, let us try to, uh, we are not going to derive the Navier-Stokes uh, equation. Let us try to understand the different terms in Navier-Stokes equation, what does it tell. Usually, the general form of Navier-Stokes equation for the conservation of momentum is rho d v by d t equal to divergence of p plus rho times f, where rho is the fluid density and d upon d by d t is the substantive, substantive derivative also called the material derivative. That means, this is the rate of change of time in the fluid frame itself and v is the velocity vector, f is the body force vector and p is the tensor that represents the surface forces applied on a fluid particle, which is the, which is the stress tensor we are going to uh, give its form now. Unless the fluid is made up of spinning degrees of spinning degrees of freedom like vortices, p is a symmetric tensor. In that case, uh, P has the form of 3 cross 3 matrices, where each element sigma x x, tau x y, tau x z similarly as you can see uh, its form, where sigma are the normal stresses and tau are the tangential stresses or shear stresses. Okay. The above equation is usually a set of three equations, one per dimension, if you will open up it for three dimension. So, it gives the three differential equation, one per each dimension, by themselves they are not sufficient to produce a solution. However, adding conservation of mass and appropriate boundary conditions to the system 
of equation produces a solvable sets of equation. So, Navier-Stokes theorem itself is not a solvable with the help of other conservation equation, conservation of mass and appropriate boundary condition, then in that case it leads to a solvable sets of equations. However, we are not going to discuss it now. Now, let us take uh, as we told you that fluid mechanics, fluids can be divided in terms of the Newtonian fluid and non-Newtonian fluid. Let us try to understand what is Newtonian fluid and what is non-Newtonian fluid. A Newtonian fluid named after Isaac Newton is defined to be a fluid whose shear stress is linearly proportional to the velocity gradient in the direction perpendicular to the plane of shear. So, this definition means regardless of the forces acting on a fluid, it continues to flow. For example, water is a Newtonian fluid because it continues to display fluid properties no matter how much it is stirred or mixed. A slightly less rigorous definition is that, that the drag of a small object being moved slowly through the fluid is proportional to the force applied to the object. Important fluids like water as well as most gases behave up to a good approximation as a Newtonian fluid under normal conditions on the earth. By contrast, stirring a non-Newtonian fluid can leave a hole behind, this will gradually fill up over time. This behavior is seen in materials such as padding, olive wake or sand although sand is not a uh, is not strictly a fluid. Alternatively, stirring a non-Newtonian fluid can cause the viscosity to decrease. So, the fluid appears thinner, this is seen in non-drip paints. There are many types of non-Newtonian fluids as they are defined to be something that fails to obey a particular property. For example, most fluid with long molecular chains can react in a non-Newtonian manner. So, now let us define what is Newtonian fluid in a mathematical form. The constant of proportionality between the shear stress and the velocity gradient as we told that if the relation is linear then it is known as the Newtonian fluid. So, if the proportionality constant is viscosity in that case a simple relation to describe uh, to define the Newtonian fluid is tau equal to minus mu dv by dy, where tau is the shear stress exerted by the fluid or drag force and mu is the fluid viscosity which is a constant of proportionality and dv by dy is the velocity gradient perpendicular to the direction of the shear. For a Newtonian fluid, the viscosity by definition depends only on temperature and pressure, not on the forces acting upon it. If the fluid is incompressible and viscosity is constant across the fluid, the equation governing the shear stress in Cartesian coordinates is tau i j equal to mu, since it is a constant del v i by del x j plus del v j by del x i where tau i j is the shear stress on the i j ith phase of a fluid element in the jth direction. i stands for phase of the fluid, j stands for the direction of the fluid and v i is the velocity of the ith direction, x j is the jth direction coordinate. If a fluid does not obey this relation, it is termed as non-Newtonian fluid of which there are several types. Among fluids, two rough broad uh, divisions can be made ideal, non-ideal fluids. An ideal fluid really does not exist, but in some calculations the assumptions is made such a way, so that it will behave like an ideal fluid. An ideal flu that means, an ideal fluid is a non-viscous which offers no resistance whatsoever to a shearing force. One can group real fluid into Newtonian and non-Newtonian. Newtonian fluids agree with Newton's law of viscosity. Non-Newtonian fluids can be either plastic, dilatant, etcetera. Now, let us try to understand from the 
uh, what does it mean by fluids, liquid, gases from a very um, uh, grassroots level. Now, let us try to understand. So, hydrostatics deals with the mechanics of fluids in equilibrium and our first step therefore, is to understand clearly as to what exactly do we mean by a fluid. Unlike a solid in which the strain set up under a shearing stress lasts throughout the period of application of the stress, whereas a fluid may be defined as that state of matter which cannot indefinitely or permanently oppose or resist a shearing stress. That is the basic difference between solid and fluid. In fact, it constantly and continuously yields to it, though the yield may be rapid in some cases and slow in others. In the former case, the liquid is said to be mobile like water, alcohol, etcetera. In the latter, viscous like honey, trickle, etcetera. In either case, however, a fluid has no definite shape of its own and assumes ultimately the shape of the containing vessel. And yet, with all these seemingly clear cut distinctions between a solid and a fluid, it is not quite so easy to distinguish between the two in many a borderline cases. There are many borderline cases where you cannot exactly distinguish which one is solid and which one is fluid. Okay. The fundamental distinctions between two nevertheless remains and we declare a substance to be a fluid or a solid according as it does or does not yield to a shearing stress applied to it over a long enough period. Fluids two are further divided into two classes liquids and gases. A liquid is a fluid which although it has no shape of its own occupies a definite volume which cannot be altered however great the force applied to it. A liquid is a fluid which is quite incompressible and has a free surface of its own as for example, water, alcohol, ether, honey, trickle etcetera. A gas on the other hand is a fluid which cannot only be easily compressed when subject to pressure, but with a progressive reduction of the pressure on it, it can also be made to expand indefinitely occupying all the space made available to it. Thus, the whole of the gas will escape out from a vessel if there be a tiniest aperture in it somewhere. If you will summarize these distinctions between fluid, solid and within a fluid liquids and gases, a gas if you will summarize all these concepts together, then a gas is a fluid which has neither a shape nor a free surface of its own example oxygen, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, air which is a mixture of gases etcetera, but liquid is a fluid which is quite incompressible and has a free surface of its own unlike the gases. Now, let us uh, try to understand how a rate of flow of a liquid can be estimated. Fluids as we know include both liquids and gases their main characteristics being that they cannot permanently withstand any shearing stresses, however it is small. We shall concern ourselves here only with ideal liquids or gases, that is with liquids which are perfectly mobile, that means there is no viscosity, that means it is ideal and incompressible means zero compressibility or infinite bulk modulus and with gases which perfectly obey the Boyle's or Charles law. So, now let us calculate the rate of flow. So, the rate of flow of a fluid is defined as the volume of it that flows across any section of a pipe in unit time. That means, uh, volume of it that flows across any section of the pipe per unit time it is really the volume rate of flow of the fluid 
or its discharge usually represented by the symbol q or v. Now, let us see this picture of a pipe. Considering the fluid to be incompressible, if its velocity of flow be v in a direction perpendicular the two sections A and B as shown in the uh, figure 1 of area A and distance L apart. And if T is the T be the time taken by the liquid to flow from A to B, we have V T should be the length of this tube which is L. So, obviously, the volume of the liquid flowing through the section A B in this time is equal to the cylindrical column A B, which is nothing but the length time area L times A, L is nothing but the V T. So, V T times A. Uh, this is therefore, the volume of the liquid flowing across this section in time t. So, which is nothing but the V t times A. So, the volume rate of flow of liquid into discharge q or v which is nothing but the V t times A by t, t uh, t will cancel which is nothing but the A times v which is nothing but the velocity of the liquid v and A is the area of the cross section of the tube. If you will measure in FPS system, this is known as cubic feet per second. This units is Q sec, which is known as Q sec, which is nothing but the cubic feet per second. Sometimes the rate of flow of a liquid is also expressed in terms of the mass of the liquid flowing across any section in unit time and is referred to as mass rate of flow. When you des, uh, de describe in terms of mass, so it is known as mass rate of flow. Thus, the mass rate of flow of liquid equal to mass of liquid flowing across any section per unit time, which is nothing but the velocity of the liquid into area of cross section into density of the liquid to get in terms of mass, which is nothing but the V times A times rho v is the velocity of the liquid, a is the area of cross section and rho is the density of liquid. Now, let us try to understand the lines and tubes of flow which are very uh, similar to the lines of force in electrostatic and magnetostatic uh, fields. Okay. So, it is very easy to understand uh, the lines of lines and tubes of flow in fluid mechanics. In a simple flow of liquid that is when it is slow and steady, the velocity at every point in the fluid remains constant in magnitude as well as in direction. This is the most important concept in the fluid mechanics. So, let me repeat it again when the velocity of the liquid is very slow and steady in that case the velocity at every point throughout the fluid remains constant in magnitude as well as in direction. The energy needed to drive it used up in overcoming the viscous drag between its layers. In other words, each particle in the fluid follows exactly the same path and has the same velocity as its predecessor and the fluid is said to have an orderly or streamlined flow. Okay. This is the meaning of streamlined flow. There are two kinds of flow, one is streamlined flow, another is turbulent flow. In streamlined flow, if every particle in the fluid follows exactly the same path and has the same velocity as its predecessor, in that case that flow is known as streamlined flow. Deviation of the streamlined flow is known as turbulent flow which is always very tough to handle. In such a case, if you consider a line in the streamline case, if you will consider a line along which the particles of the liquid move, the direction of the line at any point is the direction of the velocity of the fluid at that point. Such a line is called a streamline. More correctly, a streamline may be defined as a curve, the tangent to which at any point gives the direction of flow of the fluid at that particular point. It may be straight, 
curved according as the later, lateral pressure on it is the same throughout or different. Depending on the lateral pressure whether it is same throughout the fluid or different the size, shape of this streamline it could be straight or curved. In the latter case when the lateral pressure is different the pressure being greater on the convex side than on the concave one no two streamline can ever cross one another. So, if we consider let us uh, try to understand this thing in a given example in a given figure uh, figure 2. If you will consider two areas A and B at right angles to the direction of flow of the fluid just you see this figure 2 and draw streamlines through their boundaries as shown we obtain a tubular space a b bounded by a surface containing streamlines called a stream tube or a tube of flow. So, this is the definition of tube of flow. First we have understood what is streamline and using this streamline we can construct a uh, uh, tube uh, we can construct a stream tube or a tube of flow using two streamlines. The sides of the tube of flow being everywhere in the direction of the fluid flow, no fluid can cross the sides as though they are rigid and must enter or leave through the ends. In other words, there is no intermingling of the fluid in the two adjacent tubes of flow across the imaginary walls. This holds good however, only so long as the velocity of the liquid does not exceed a particular limiting value called its critical velocity, beyond which the flow of liquid loses all its steadiness and orderliness and becomes zigzag or sinus acquiring what is called as turbulent motion. So, whatever descriptions I have given those description is only valid when the velocity uh, of the liquid does not exceed a particular limiting value known as the critical velocity. This thing can be also be understood in terms of the Reynolds number. If the critical velocity will be too large, the Reynolds number will be too greater than 1. In that cases, the these concepts will no longer valid. This may be easily seen by introducing a, a small jet of a coloring matter. Let us try to do this experiment also in this figure like ordinary ink for example, axially into a tube A B you just see this figure A B through which water may be made to flow with gradually increasing velocity by raising the water head responsible for the flow. It will be seen that as long as the velocity of water flow remains below its critical value, there is only a thin streak of the coloring matter along the axis of the tube as you can see in figure 3 signifying a steady streamline motion. But as soon as the velocity attains its critical value the coloring matter takes a zigzag path uh, which is shown in figure 3 indicating haphazard change of velocity from point to point and consequent distortion of the tubes of flow. And later when this value is exceeded far apart, the coloring matter spreads out in all directions filling the entire tube showing that the tubes of flow have now broken down and the motion has become utterly disorderly or turbulent. So, this experiment even you can perform in your home also in your small lab also that that shows you uh, the streamline flow and the turbulent flow. Reynolds actually used this very method to determine the critical velocity for water. Uh, obviously, the velocity of the water just before the thin streak of the coloring matter becomes zigzag or sinus directly gives the value of the critical velocity V c for it and is equal to the rate of flow of the liquid that is the volume of the liquid flowing out of the tube per second divided by the area of the cross section of the tube. 
So, from there Reynolds calculated the critical velocity, from there he calculated the Reynolds number, uh, if the velocity is less than it, it will be the streamlined flow, if the velocity will be more the critical velocity, it will be the turbulent flow.